one of the most significant events, we are told, of John Paul II's pontificate is the promulgation of a new catechism. Some have looked upon it as a bastion of orthodoxy and conservatism. Others maybe aren't so sure. We'd like to take another look. I'm Julius Matona. This is what Catholics believe. With me today to discuss the new catechism are Father William Jenkins uh, of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parham, Ohio, and Father Clarence Kelly, spiritual director of Daughters of Mary, Mother of Our Savior, a congregation of traditional Roman Catholic sisters. Uh, Reverend Fathers, we uh, last time discussed the, the, the spirit, the scope of, of the new catechism, uh, its raison d'etre, why it was introduced. Uh, maybe we can look into it a little more deeply. Um, we mentioned last time that uh, one of the areas which is certainly ambiguous and not quite in accord with traditional teaching was uh, on marriage. Uh, are there any other areas that you find to be uh, questionable uh, which might not be orthodox and which in fact would represent a departure from the traditional Catholic norms? I would say uh, one of the things we did mention uh, in the last program, but we didn't perhaps get into as much as we could have, is the question of giving Holy Communion to uh, people who do not have the Catholic faith. That's a very, very serious thing. That's not, that's not ambiguous. That's not confusing. That represents an attack on the Blessed Sacrament. That represents an attack on the unity of the Catholic Church. So we're dealing here with something which actually makes sacrilege the norm. So that's what this catechism does. This catechism takes the Holy Eucharist and makes it an object of attack and sanctions the sacrilegious giving of Holy Communion to people who, don't, who are heretics, actually. Who, who deny many of the, the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And it, in fact, it is so grave, it is so serious, it is so momentous, uh, that I, I think it, it may be uh, impossible to overstate it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and catech this catechism is a universal catechism for the whole Church. Uh, that in itself, apart from any other consideration, would destroy uh, the integrity of the catechism, just as, for example, Apart from any other consideration, uh, the fact that the new Code of Canon Law does the same thing destroys the integrity and the validity uh, of the new Code of Canon Law. Because the Code of Canon Law does the same thing, sanctions uh, sacrilege against blessed sacrament. Here's what I would see as an objection from, say, the average Catholic in the pew. They might say, look, Father, there are so many good things in this catechism. So what if it has one mm -hmm. thing? How does that affect the whole? Well, it affects the whole the same way, if, if I can use an analogy that I, I started to use uh, in one of the other programs. Uh, it would affect it in this way. If you had your family gathered around the, the dinner table on Sunday, uh, and everything was prepared and looked very beautiful, and it had a nice clean tablecloth and uh, all types of appetizers and, uh, and vegetables and fruits, and someone said to you that everything on the table is good. Uh, except uh, in a couple of items on the table, there is uh, uh, cyanide. So let's, let's sit down and eat Sunday dinner now. I mean, what would you do? You would I say, wouldn't eat Sunday dinner. You wouldn't eat Sunday <laughs> dinner. In other words, you wouldn't say to someone who objected, you wouldn't say to them, but it's only in one or two items, you know, or three right. items, and, uh, and everything else on the table is good, so let's just go ahead and pick and choose and hope that we don't uh, become poisoned by the items that happen to have cyanide. Now, obviously, anyone with any common sense would say, we will have nothing to do with what has been set out on that table because we may get poisoned and die from it. And yet, as, as dramatic an example as that is, it is really inadequate when it comes to matters touching the life of the soul, the life of the Catholic faith uh, in, in an individual, because the effects of, of eating poison is the death of the body, the effects of eating spiritual poison is the death of the soul. You know, Father, well, suppose, <clears throat> though, uh, I was asked to you know, witness a marriage or perform a marriage between one of my own Catholic parishioners and uh, a, uh, a fiancé of hers, 
who uh, had some very close Protestant friends. And I met these Protestant friends, and I realized, well, this is a very nice person, and that is a very nice person. Let's say even her fiancé might be Protestant, so right. let's say it would be a mixed marriage. And he would assure me, well, you know, Father, I really do believe that the, the Eucharist is substantially the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. But I have trouble with, you know, this, or I have trouble with that, or I don't believe in purgatory, or, you know, the virgin birth, or, or heaven whatever, or hell. heaven, or, well, whatever, you know, yeah. let's take anything. Sure. And he says, I just have problems with that, and um, I'm just really not convinced of that. Why couldn't I go ahead and become this, um, because it was the occasion of his marriage to this girl, and he seemed like such a good fellow, and has such good will, and professed faith in the real presence, like a Catholic would, why couldn't I go ahead and give him Holy Communion? Well, uh, according to the Catechism, and according to the Code of Canon Law, not only could you do it, but you would, in a certain sense, be obliged to do it. Hmm. In other words, he could say to you, Father, I do believe uh, in the real presence, uh, and therefore, I want to receive Holy Communion at my wedding. And let's say you say to him, not you, but let's say the average parish priest would say to him, but uh, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I, I don't believe that should be done. He could say, the code of canon law says I have a right to approach a Catholic priest uh, and to, re to request the sacraments. Well, I, I know it exactly what I would do. I would approach the bishop of the diocese who would back me up. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, something tells me I'd be on a first train out of, out of town. Right? Well, 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 you would uh, be un unless he needed you for something else. But the point, of course, is that what was in the past a sacrilege becomes the norm. Uh, and it becomes the norm in what is a universal catechism for the whole church and also in the code of canon law. Why would that be wrong, though? Well, Why would it be wrong for me to give him Holy Communion? It would be wrong because the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of unity, as well as being the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is Holy Communion. It is the sacrament of unity. When you receive Holy Communion from a priest, that is a, an external declaration that you share the same faith. When you as a priest give Holy Communion to a person, what you are doing is you are actually saying in an external fashion that your faith and the faith of this person is the same. So if you give Holy Communion to someone who rejects the Catholic faith, then what you are saying externally is that uh, you reject the teachings of Christ. But couldn't I just say, well, in this particular instance, our faith is the same? Let's say with regard to this particular doctrine. You could, because there may conceivably, I mean, I don't really think that there are any Protestants who believe what the Catholic Church teaches in the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. they, the Lutherans believe in the real presence. They do not believe in transubstantiation. But let's assume well, let's they did. Let's say a high Anglican. Well, let's say a high Anglican who did. The reason you couldn't do it is because in order to have the faith you have to believe everything that was divinely revealed and infallibly taught by the church. You can't pick and choose. As soon as you begin to pick and choose, you don't have the faith. Well, that's the very meaning of heresy, right? To it's the very choose, meaning of heresy and, and, uh, and, is, and is, you know, contrary to what it means to have the faith. Mm -hmm. When you have the faith, you believe everything that the church... Well, Father, Father, when you Father mentioned teaches. heresy, I think there's a, a, a general <clears throat> misconception of what, what the nature of heresy is like and what it appeared when it first popped its head into the scene. I think a lot of people might think something heretical is so obvious and transparent and striking that no one could mistake it. Isn't, in fact, the opposite true? For instance, if one would have seen the heresy during the Arian heresy, it was very, very subtle in its form, the way it was presented. Well, well it was, but to sort of try and finish that, the, the question of why is it so important that people have uh, the faith? And, and the answer is this. The answer is that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us the truth, okay? And he said, you must believe this. He didn't leave it up to every individual to pick and choose what they would believe. He said to the apostles, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes shall be saved. He that does not shall be condemned. So our Lord says, here is the truth. I am the Son of God, he says, and you must believe this truth in order to be my disciple. You have to give assent with your mind to the truth I reveal, and you have to submit to my commandments. The Holy Eucharist is the sacrament uh, which binds together those who have the faith, that is to say, those who accept everything that our Lord Jesus Christ taught, and who submit to his law. If you take the Holy Eucharist and you give it to someone who rejects the teaching of Christ, what you are doing is you are saying to them, 
Forget about him. He's only the Son of God. You know, the Son of God said you have to believe this, but I'm telling you, you don't. And therefore, I am setting up this relationship of unity with you and excluding what he demands. That's why it is a sacrilege. In other words, it is a sacrilegious abuse of the sacrament of unity. It is excluding the truth that Christ revealed and that Christ insists we believe. It's an abomination, actually. Well, actually, the reason why I was asking the question was because I, I wanted to, to highlight something uh, that I, I think is important to say about this new catechism. I think it undermines the very notion of supernatural faith. The whole idea. Uh, you mentioned uh, speaking with forked tongue before, but I think that's exactly what the catechism does. Because you can talk about the faith, which is uh, uh, the, the complexus of doctrines, which are divinely revealed, and then you can talk about the virtue of faith, by which supernatural virtue we assent to the doctrines, right. right? And this seems to be an attack on the very virtue of faith, which is simply an acceptance, uh, and a firm adherence to the teachings of, of Christ on the authority of Christ on the authority of his church, right. uh, on the authority of sacred tradition and sacred scripture, both united. And uh, to say, therefore, that one can dissent from faith and not believe this doctrine or not believe that doctrine and still approach Holy Communion uh, because he believes, in, let's say, that there is the real presence of Christ, but perhaps only that, uh, this is a, a direct attack on the very nature of supernatural faith. It undermines everything the Catholic Church stands for. And on the deposit of faith, too, actually. Mm -hmm. You're watching mm -hmm. what Catholics believe. We're just, Reverend Fathers, um, how we've identified one, well, more than one striking right. departure. How does this put uh, the whole picture, what kind of a context does it put it in? Because now we see that John Paul, the catechism, the catechism in its promulgation, John right. Paul II invokes his apostolic authority to ensure that this is the full norm and you can safely follow this as a norm for Catholic teaching, yet this norm is shown to be defective. What does that tell us? Does it mean that infallibility and impeccability are a lie? or that perhaps John Paul II possesses no authority? Well, it, it does present some very serious problems, as does the Code of Canon Law, because uh, the holiness of the Church uh, provides a secondary infallibility. The, the, the Church that was established by Christ is holy by nature, and it could not impose, for example, a law on the whole Church which is unholy. And yet the new Code of Canon Law is unholy. It's, it's unholy in its effect, and it's unholy uh, in actually what it provides for, which is the desecration of the Holy Eucharist uh, in the sense that the Holy Eucharist is desecrated when it is given to people who do not have the Catholic faith and a sacrilege is committed. So that presents a very serious problem because it is impossible for a Roman Catholic Pope <clears throat> to promulgate an unholy code of canon law, and yet the new code is unholy. Similarly, theologians teach that catechisms, for example, like the universal catechism of the church, is protected also by this secondary uh, infallibility, and yet we know that this particular catechism uh, uh, promulgates uh, things, provides for things which are irreconcilable with the Catholic religion. That presents a very serious problem as to the status of the one who, who, uh, who put these things out. Right. But, but from the practical point of view, as far as the average person, I think the point that Father Jenkins made is very significant, that we're, we have the same Vatican II game. You know, we, we have him saying, well, by our, our apostolic authority we do this, and in the very next breath he says, you don't have to follow this catechism anyway. So, so it, it's a little bit of a concession in some sense, let's say, for conservatives, and it is, uh, it is uh, approval for the liberals uh, to, to reject everything in here that they want to reject and to insist on everything they want to insist on, like intercommunion and also the ecumenical view of the Roman Catholic Church. Maybe you could even explain a little this uh, ecumenical view because I think it's a, it's a necessary first step to justify the intercommunion. When we read in the New Catechism of who is in the church, we get a number of definitions, one of which is 
fairly traditional. The other, which lumps everyone in, and then the other says that in a certain sense we're in communion with Pro Protestants. What does this certain sense mean? Either in your, you're in communion or you're not. And then others who are even non-believers. Uh, what would uh, your feeling be toward this kind of a complexus which they offer of the definition of who is in the church and what is the church? I think it represents an attack on the teaching of the Catholic Church as to uh, what she is uh, and what her mission is. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He established the church. There's no question about that. And, uh, you know, I, I admit and I understand that there are a lot of people who are not in the church who are well-intentioned, you know, who are in search of the truth. And I certainly don't mean to, you know, render any blanket condemnation or uh, imputation of bad will to everybody. But that, that's another question. The, the question of the objective thing that our Lord did was He established a church. He established one church. He didn't establish two or three or five or ten. He established one single church. And if anyone wants to know which church it was that he established, the very first thing they would have to do is to set apart all the churches that are 2,000 years old and then determine from those which are 2,000 years old which is the true church. But when you do that, you discover that there's only one church that's 2,000 years old. Hmm. That is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is his mystical body. He gave to his church authority. He gave to his church a commission to preach the truth, to preserve the truth, to preserve the deposit of faith. And that the church is the ark of salvation. It is like Noah's ark. The fathers of the church liken the Catholic Church to Noah's ark. And if you want to be saved from the flood, you have to get into the ark. And the mission of the bishops and the mission of the popes is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. And the, that is the gospel of the kingdom. You see, that's something which a lot of people don't realize. It's not the gospel of accepting Christ as your personal savior. It's the gospel of the kingdom. You have to enter the kingdom to be saved. And while it is true that people could be joined to the church, could be joined to the ark of salvation by intention and desire, it is not true that other churches are means of salvation. This catechism explicitly teaches that other churches are means of salvation, and that is a radical, dramatic uh, uh, departure from Catholic teaching. As does Vatican II. As does Vatican II. You know, the words of our Lord to the apostles when he sent them out into the world were very significant, and even though they're denied by many modern-day so-called Catholics, uh, they'll have to take issue with our Lord when they see him, when they face him as he will take issue with them. He said, going therefore, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He didn't say some of the things, the things that they will accept, or the things that you find convenient to teach, or politically expedient to teach. He said, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he said, those who believe and are baptized will be saved, and those who will not believe will be condemned. If someone wishes to take that up with our Lord someday, I wish him luck. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think he's going to, uh, to lose the argument. Uh, this is what we have to go on. We, we have to go not on the basis of uh, human respect and what people want to hear, or whether we will be admired and, and received well for teaching only what people are willing to accept. We have to preach the, the whole gospel as it is, uh, including the hard sayings, the, the indissolubility of marriage, the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, and so on. Uh, that is not what this catechism does. It says, well, this is what the church has taught, but you don't have to believe it in order to uh, do the most solemn act that a Catholic can do, and that is receive the Blessed Sacrament, the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. Father Jenkins. I think it's a disservice too to, uh, to sincere uh, non-Catholics. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think you have to, to, to patronize. I think that you can enter into uh, you know, a reasonable discussion and you can be honest and true to what the church teaches and if people want to accept it, fine. If they don't want to accept it, it's up to them too. Mm -hmm. Father Jenkins, uh, you know, there have been rampant attacks on the divinity of Christ within the post-conciliar religion. There are many people who are considered to be in good standing, 
theologians who deny the divinity of Christ. Now, there was one thing that caught my attention uh, in, in the New Catechism when it mentioned that it, it admitted that our Lord, quote, he admitted to not knowing something in this area, what he admitted to not knowing in this area. I'm taking a, a little quote. It was on page 20, number 474. And it, from that, I think it can be implied that our Lord had a positive ignorance about something. Right. And yet we find in, in, uh, in uh, Denzinger, and I, it was stated in the Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Dr. Ott, that Christ's human knowledge was free from positive ignorance and from error. How would one reconcile these two, and what would be the purpose of inserting this fairly subtle phrase in the Catechism? Well, as it is stated in the New Catechism, I don't see any way to reconcile the two. Uh, this statement reads as follows. By its union to the divine wisdom in the person of the Word incarnate, Christ enjoyed in his human knowledge the fullness of understanding of the eternal plans he had come to reveal. What he admitted to not knowing in this area he elsewhere declared himself not sent to reveal. Now, this in, contains at least a, an implicit contradiction, you know, right. the idea oh. of our Lord admitting that he didn't know. He knew everything, but then he didn't yeah. know it, right? By the way, that uh, might be a, a slight departure from what is contained in the typical French edition, which is the standard that is to be followed, but the sense is the same. And, of course, uh, this reminds me of what I first heard when I was a senior in high school. Toward the end of my senior year, uh, my class and I were herded into an auditorium under the watchful eye of the then liberalizing nuns, and we watched a, I think it was a National Conf uh, Council of Churches film uh, in which Christ was portrayed as a clown in the circus. And because he succeeded in gaining the attention and the affection, especially of the children in the audience, he incurred the wrath and envy of the ringmaster who has strung him up on the trapeze until he died. And then the ringmaster felt so remorseful that, what, that he had done something so low to the clown that he went to the clown's trailer and did himself up as the clown and took the clown's place in the circus. So this was supposed to be the, the National Council of Churches answer to the resurrection, evidently. But anyway, when we were herded back into the classroom after this, uh, watching this travesty, uh, I remember the nun asking us uh, what we thought about this new idea that Jesus did not know he was God until he was 12 years old, and suddenly he, he found out. Now, one little girl uh, was faced with that same question. Also, this was in elementary school. I heard the same question was being battered all about about the same time, and one little girl raised her hand and said, Boy, I bet he was really surprised. <laughs> um, he found out he was God. Well, he found out he was God. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the point is, this, this statement in the New Catechism reminded me of that. And, uh, of course, if he truly was God, he was God always, you know, from the moment of conception. Uh, he was God, and he had the wisdom and knowledge of God. Uh, the fact is, when our Lord said, uh, that it was not given to him to reveal uh, the, the, the exact details of the last days of the world uh, when he would return. Uh, his point was that I cannot tell you this. He was not professing he didn't uh, know. that right. he didn't Ignorance. know this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. I, I think uh, what has to be said is that, remember, there's only one person, one person, Jesus Christ. There's no human person, Jesus Christ, only the divine person. And that divine person is a, a divine nature and a human nature. But even in his human nature, in his human intellect that was created, human intellect, he had what is referred to as quasi-infinite knowledge, even in his created human intellect. But he, the person, the, it's the person who knows, and he knows through his intellect. So he, the, 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 in his divine person, he, he had the comprehensive knowledge of God because he was God. But even in his human intellect, there was quasi-infinite knowledge. How would you, you know, just sum up the new catechism and what effect it's going to have in the dichotomy between what's contained in the catechism and what's practiced, especially to the Catholic who's trying to hold to the tradition in some way or some shape or form? I would just say this. I would say for the reform that began 30 years ago, and this catechism was uh, issued on the 30th anniversary right. of the opening of Vatican II, 
I would say the reformers uh, took the church, tried to put the church to death, put the church in a coffin, and began to to seal it with a series of nails in the post-Vatican II reforms. And this, for them, I think, is the last nail in the coffin. But of course we know that the church is not in the coffin because the church is the mystical body of Christ and is as indestructible as is God himself. Father Jenkins? Julius, what you mentioned a moment ago about them uh, implicitly denying knowledge in Christ, mm -hmm. I think is, is part of an undermining of the very notion of God. For example, on page 100 in the New Catechism, number 399, it says this, Scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. Well, that's not a distorted image of God. He said, I am Sacred a jealous God. Sacred Scripture says, I am a jealous God. This is God revealing. He is jealous for the undivided um, attention of our love. I mean, this is the whole point. He is motivated by love. And... Uh, you know, if you, if you deny his jealousy of his prerogatives as the creator, you deny his very nature. You've been watching what Catholic